to Japan, but you were born in London, England at a turbulent time.、Uh, we were about to, the world was about to fall into a great economic depression, and then, and then the Second World War. What was like, life like for your family during those years? Well, it, it was pretty difficult. I mean, I don't remember those first five years,、um, but I, I do well recall the,、uh, the beginning of the war. And for a youngster of, what, 12 or so, that was pretty exciting. I mean, wars then were, were fun, they, they were challenging and exciting. And so we used to play games, you know, Germans against Britons, the way we used to play cowboys against Indians. Brits always won the way the cowboys always won. Of course they would.、Uh, today, people seldom use the terms low church and high church, but 70 years ago, it was, it was a different situation, wasn't it? Well, I'd never heard high church, low church in Canada.、Um, people didn't know what that meant. In England, it was very, very significant.、Um, you knew which party of the church you belonged to, you adhered strictly to it, you didn't mix with the others. And so I was low church, didn't know any high church, didn't want to, didn't go near them. Until I, I came to Caledonia and started to meet other clergy with other traditions. And started to have to rethink. Not that I wanted to become particularly high church, but to recognize the values that I had not even thought about. So that was a very significant turning point, chiefly with, with、um, John Frame, who later became Bishop of Yukon. And he and I were ch- in churchmanship, we were miles apart. And we were genuinely brothers in Christ, for, and still to this day. So that was, the, that was significant to me. As a young person, what were the influences on you? What, what led you to begin thinking of the priesthood?、Oh, it's, it's almost unbelievable, but it was a sermon. Imagine that.、Um, when I, I felt that the, the vicar was speaking to me, and I had a feeling I had to go and say to the vicar, You know, this is, this is what you said to me. And from then on, he sort of nursed me, mentored me right through to ordination. Yeah. So at, at the conclusion of the war,、uh, you joined the Royal Army Service Corps.、Uh, where did you serve and what were your duties? Well, I, I, I served、um, as a motorcyclist in England for a bit, very briefly. I was an ambulance driver in the,、um, in the occupation army in northern Italy, just outside Venice. And then most of my time in Palestine,、um, driving trucks and riding motorbikes and that sort of thing. Wait, what was your impression of、uh, Europe in those first post war years? Well, I, I was in northern Italy and the people were fairly poor. They were very friendly and welcoming. And I, I, had a, I had a fabulous time. I mean, I was driving an ambulance all over northern Italy,、um, picking up patients, taking patients all over the place,、uh, all sorts of exciting, I thought, ex- pretty exciting things for an 18 year old. And、uh, so I wasn't aware of any sort of political undertones of all that. It was just the army was a good life. Then you were in the Middle East at a crucial period.、Uh, the British had given up their mandate, and、uh, a year later,、uh, the State of Israel was established. Yeah, well, I, I went to Palestine and then moved up into, into Israel. It wasn't Israel then, of course. And、um, it was during that time that the, the Israelis started being very、um, noisy about wanting to end the mandate. And so they harassed the British occupation, the mandate poli-、uh, soldiers. And they chased us around a lot and they, they tricked us. They didn't do anything serious. Well, they did, they did, uh, they did um, uh, what do you call it? Sort of, they snatched a couple of soldiers and, and tortured them and killed them. But that was quite rare.、Mm-hmm. But、um, you, you, know, you kept your head down. And you hope. It was, a, of some it was a, lot of, a lot of violence between Ju- Jews and Arabs.、Mm-hmm. The only common ground they had was they both hated the British. So that was,、uh, they got some comfort in harassing us. 
How did uh, military life uh, affect your philosophy, your later thinking? Um, I think the chief thing about the army is I, I, I learned a discipline. There was no point in arguing about whether I wanted to do something or not. The other thing I learned was that I, I learned what the real world was like. Um, there was no sort of religious protection. Uh, they didn't spare me any conversations or language because I was going to be a priest one day. In fact, I think sometimes they, fellow soldiers deliberately made a point of aggravating me in that way. So it, it, it kept my feet very firmly on the ground, in the mud really, to say this is what it's really like. Um, not protected, not, not sort of secluded, not otherworldly, um, very much in the world and, and that's where you have to function and minister and be a, a part of a mission. So that was a great learning process for me. I'd, I'd been brought up in the church, I'd lived that kind of sheltered church life. I, I knew all about the prayer book, you know, that sort of thing. No, that didn't cut any ice. When, with the army. In fact, when they discovered, when it was in one camp, it was discovered I, I was going to be a priest, it was, it was made a point that I would be put on duty every Sunday. So there was no possibility of going any, anywhere near a church. Uh, that, was, that was quite deliberate, and you get used to that. And it's lasted to this day. I'm very much aware of the, the real world. So you returned to England and you were ordained as a priest and you served uh, in a parish there, but then in 1956 you decided to come to Canada. What made you decide to do that? Well, this same priest, same vicar, who'd done a lot of work in, in Canada, in Winnipeg. I'd heard a lot about Canada and I just wanted to spend a couple of years over here seeing what it was like. So Denise and I got married in 56 and left pretty well immediately within a, with a few couple of months, three months. And we went to the Yukon border to Cassia and worked from there and, and kept on, after two years decided we'd come back to England, go back to England. That didn't, that didn't work out. There was a, a reason for the bishop asking me to stay on a bit longer. So after the next parish, I, we decided to moved back to England and I actually got a parish in London and then at the last minute Bishop Munn said will you stay on so I stayed on and I've never thought about going back since but I didn't plan to spend 60 years in Canada. The adjustment must have been challenging you had left a sophisticated uh, urban parish and uh, came to a, a small town a small industrial town that had a uh, a population that was only a fraction of the uh, congregation you'd had in England. Well, it, the parish in England wasn't sophisticated. It was in the deep slums of London, East London. Um, it was uh, a huge, huge church. Um, it seated about 2,500 with a gallery. Not that it ever did in my time there. We couldn't even have filled the gallery. But it was a big church. It was the only church for some miles around, and so we did all the baptisms, all the weddings, all the funerals, and it was a, it was a great parish. I enjoyed being there. Um, youth group uh, was very strong, very busy, and um, I'm still in touch with some of those young kids. They're all grandparents now. Um, and then we knew, Denise and I knew we were coming to Canada, and so we arrived in Cassia, where the average congregation was probably about 20. And there were five Anglicans in that group. Denise was one of them. Um, we had a mixture, including a Christian scientists and, a, a, well, I don't know what else we had. Lots of Presbyterians. My first warden was a Presbyterian. Um, it was a community church. So we would, the bishop said I was to minister to everybody that would allow me to minister, all non-Romans. There was a Roman church down the road. So that's the way we functioned uh, for two years. And I, first of all, tried to make it into an English parish. In fact, when they said, what do we call you? And I said, oh, you call me vicar. 
They said, no, we meant, what do we call you, Doug or Douglas? <laughs> so I had to rethink my, my life in, in, the, in the parish. It was very different. And at the end of it, I, I, both Denise and I left feeling we'd failed dismally because um, it was so, so different. We'd never heard of culture shock. That was what it was, and we just didn't know. And we left with, I left with my tail between my legs and went to Smithers. That was a very different story. Your first bishop in Caledonia was uh, Horace Watts, and the yes. second was Eric Munn. Uh, how, what sort of influence did those men have on you? Well, I, I don't know. I don't think Horace had any influence on me. Um, I did learn from him when, when he came to visit me in Cassia, and I said to him very respectfully, would you like to preach at the service? And he said, when I'm here, I decide who preaches. <laughs> I learned that lesson about how to be a bishop. And uh, the, other, the only thing I think I learned from, from Horace was that there are worse things than vacancies. I think it was a silly appointment to put me in Cassia. Um, it, it was absurd to put a person without any preparation into a place like Cassia. And so that I learned that from him, although he, he didn't ever know it. Eric was a different matter. And he was an extreme Anglo-Catholic, a saintly man, and we hit it off right from the beginning. We became very, very close, and I have greatest regard for him. He was a terrible preacher. Um, everybody agreed, I think Eric agreed, um, but he loved people. And it, it, it didn't matter that he didn't preach very well. He just loved being with people. And he used to say, you know my dears, he loved, everybody was my dear. And he was just a saintly man and uh, everybody loved him. And the problem when I became bishop was to say, look, I'm not Eric Munn, I'm, I'm me. <laughs> when you were in the North, you began a, a parallel career as a radio broadcaster and you enjoyed that, didn't you? Well, it, it wasn't parallel, it was a sort of a sideline, a, a, a new, pa new, um, station opened and the, the, the manager was looking around for Canadian content and decided I'd do. So I used to do an evening evening thing. Um, I can't remember what it was, called, thought for the day or some such thing like that. And I used to talk about whatever, not too religious. Um, I didn't see any point in, in preaching. I'd learned that from the army, you know, you, you you, you attack the, the, the situation differently. I used to read things from uh, the old histories of uh, BC Church, the church in British Columbia, fascinating stories of the pioneers, and the people that used to love that, they used to write and say, we, you know, tell us some more. On Friday nights, I'd recite the, all the uh, services for the coming Sunday from all the different churches, and, and uh, they'd have Oh, they'd, come, they'd get, send me their subjects and titles, and I'd read them out and say, if you want to go to the Pentecostal church this Sunday, this is the subject. And one of them was, uh, one of, I remember one of the uh, preachers from the Pentecostal church, his, his service the following Sunday was to be, um, beware of dogs. It's a phrase from St. Paul somewhere. And so I said, having said, beware of dogs, I thought, I bet he's preaching about Anglicans. Well, I got a lot of comment from, from that. It was, it was just a fun time. And so when I went to Fort St. John, the, uh, the manager of the local CKNL asked me to do the same thing. And I used to do every morning um, a live broadcast and every Sunday morning a taped half hour magazine. And uh, sometimes in the evenings I'd do a talk show. It was. It was different, and it, it touched people that never got near a church, um, and it spoke to them about the things of God without being preachy or you know, haranguing them about not being in church. So they were good days. Uh, you established unusually close and good relations with the Aboriginal people of the North, the Nishkas, the Gitskan, yeah. and you were an advocate for them on many occasions, uh, dealing at both the federal and provincial levels on issues from uh, fishing rights to land claims. 
What are some of the memorable encounters you had? Well, first of all, it, it wasn't simply, I don't think it was simply I, de I decided to be an advocate. The diocese um, took this up at synods and, and would, would tell me in a synod that this is what I was to do. I mean, they, the, the synod really governed that diocese in so many ways and sort of led me into advocacy. And I think of one occasion when the, the then federal minister of fisheries announced he was closing down uh, oh, a huge number of licenses which would destroy the, the fishing industry for the First Nations people. That we went, the diocese really went on the attack. And uh, I found myself on radio talk shows talking about this very subject, that um, it was grossly unfair to, to say to people whose land it is, we're not going to allow you to fish in your, your seas. And uh, I remember the response actually did more, me, my cause more good than anything else was from the federal minister himself, because his response on a, on a radio program was to say, the bishop seems to think that God put these fish in the waters. Let me tell him it was the federal government. Well, I had fan, fan mail from all over the province because it was such a stupid thing to say. But that was the point. And that was our, our advocacy. The diocese would say, we've got to tackle this. 50% of Caledonia is First Nations. You can't just say, well, they're an offshoot. They're a sideline. They were a vital part of the diocese as much as anybody else was. I think the fisheries minister then was Jack Davis. Yes, I wasn't going to mention his name, but yes. The, uh, the very close relationship with the uh, First Nations people, and uh, you were adopted into the Wolf Tribe. Tell us about that. No, I was adopted into the Raven Clan. Um, I wanted to be adopted into the Eagle. I thought an Eagle was more impressive than a Raven. But they decided no, and they, I said why, and my adopting mother said because the raven is a talkative bird. So I was adopted by the ravens. Well, one of your major accomplishments uh, in uh, Caledonia was the licensing of uh, native clergy uh, recommended by their communities. Yeah, the, the, they were not recommended, they were identified um, they, the, the, bishop, the people saw themselves as choosing, not simply suggesting. And so they'd have long meetings with me present while they would discuss their future ministry and they would identify a person to be prepared for ordination. And I mean, they took this very seriously as their responsibility. In fact, after one deaconing, Right at the end of the service, I was standing with one of the chiefs and I said, well, I guess I'll come back next year and make him a priest. And the response was interesting. He said, we'll let you know. Um, you know, this was not something that the bishop does for them. This is what the bishop does among them and, and they make choices. And so, yeah, we, we trained and raised up a number of clergy among the First Nations, um, the Niska. It was more difficult with the Hyder because when the subject was raised, they said, why, why, don't you, why don't we deserve a white priest anymore? They were quite, we said they'd been drummed into them by the missionaries <laughs> that uh, Indians can't be priests. So it was a, quite a while before we had a big, big ordination service of two Hyder and we had the federal government present. Iona Campanolo, great supporter of First Nations, came and, and attended that service, and it was a magnificent time when one was made a priest, one was made a deacon, and they served faithfully you know, for the longest time. Well, after a decade in Caledonia, roughly a decade, uh, you were translated, a curious term, to uh, U.S. Minster. And uh, the transition must have been difficult in a way as you were overseeing the change in Caledonia and uh, your entry into New Westminster. Uh, yeah, how, did you, how did you balance well, those? Well, I didn't want to leave Caledonia. Um, in fact, I, uh, when, pe when someone said they wanted to nominate me, I, I really said, no, I'm fine where I am. Um, two or three people said I should be nominated and I eventually thought, well, I suppose it's, n it's none of my business. That if, if God wants me to move, something will happen. 
but I'm quite content to stay in Caledonia. Well, it happened, and I got a phone call one day saying, guess what, you've been elected Bishop of Caledonia, no, a coadjutor of Caledonia. Um, that was a, a shock, and more of a shock for my children because they, they were being uprooted. And, uh, but we came down here, and uh, totally different diocese. It couldn't have been more different. The only advantage I had was that at least I'd been a bishop for a dozen years. I, you know, I didn't have to learn how to put my hat on, which hand to hold a staff. I, you know, I'd done the mechanics of the job. And uh, it was a different diocese. It was, uh, Caledonia was a much more of a family, a community. There was a sense of parishes belonging to one another, a great sense of community. I came to, Cal to New Westminster and found a very fragmented diocese where each parish was a, an identity in the, on its own and not having much to do with any of the others. Um, so that was a bit of a shock. It was a difficult time for the diocese. Uh, they were facing financial deficits then that you had to deal with. Well, there was, there was one. Um, there was only one serious one that um, we, when our then treasurer uh, suddenly announced that we were overdrawn dramatically, and I had to call a special synod to say, what's, you know, what's going on? And I found that parishes were not sending any stipend in or insurance, but we were still paying. And so we had to make a few changes in the regulations that said, you don't send anything in, your priest doesn't get paid, and there'll be no insurance on your buildings. So we, we got through that. I thought it was a very positive time because the diocese had to learn that it had some responsibility for itself and not just assume that I would manage everything. 